The archipelago of Svalbard is located in the high Arctic at 78 degrees north. Longyearbyen, as the main settlement, is situated on the island of Spitsbergen and hosts UNIS, the university center on Svalbard. Svalbard comprises an almost continuous record of sediment deposition over the past 370 million years. In spring and summer, some of Svalbard's spectacular outcrops can be studied, digitized and made available for further research. This is an introduction to the Svalbox digital database. If you hadn't guessed by the video, Svalbox is to do with the geology of Svalbard. The Svalbard has an amazing geological history and an amazing history of geologists and other scientists who have collected immense amounts of data over the decades. The Svalbox database is essentially our effort to gather this data so it can be easily accessed and put into the context of Svalbard's unique geological history. So here we can see some of the data already imported into Svalbox. This includes regional data like cross sections or geophysics and more locally focused information from outcrops and boreholes and of course everything in between. Because of this great diversity in data, we have decided that Schlumberger's software Petrel is the best platform to host the Svalbox database. Let's start off by going to one of the more studied areas of Svalbard, a place on the west coast called Festningen. So Festningen is classed as a geotope. This is because of the exceptional outcrops along the coastline here, and this even includes some well-preserved dinosaur tracks. So these coloured symbols that we can see here represent sedimentary logs that have been taken from different points along the outcrop. And what we can see here is the map updating itself every time we zoom in or out to make sure we see the appropriate level of detail for the scale that we're using. So before we look at the data itself, let's just have a quick look at what makes Festningen so special. Starting in the west of the Festningen profile with the Carboniferous Clastic Sediments, Carbonates and Evaporites, we quickly reach the Permian with the continuation of Carbonate and Evaporite deposition. The steeply inclined sediments at the Festingen profile allow us to walk along the beach and pass through 360 million years of nearly continuous sedimentary record. Passing one of Earth's largest mass extinction events, the Permian-Triassic boundary, we see the deposition of marine organic rich shales, shallow marine sandstones and siltstones. During the Jurassic, we see the deposition of shallow marine sandstones and in late Jurassic times, deep marine organic rich shales. The Cretaceous on Svalbard shows a regression and the subsequent deposition of the prominent Festingen sandstone. In some locations, we can even find dinosaur footprints. The Cretaceous also marks Svalbard's largest gap in sedimentary record of 40 million years. At the end of the Festningen profile, we reach Paleogene deposits. These include coal seams, which form the backbone of Svalbard settlements. A quick search on Google Scholar shows 696 results just for this outcrop. This really highlights why we're trying to get all this useful data together into one place. This here is a sedimentary log from that prominent sandstone we can see right below us. Uh, now, what we can do is display this alongside other sedimentary logs from this same area. At first glance, these four logs from different parts of the outcrop seem to be quite similar, but when we look in more detail, we can actually see that they cover very different intervals. The log on the right-hand side is very detailed and covers about 20 meters of sandstone, while the image second from the left covers more than 2,000 meters of geology. So we've dealt with the outcrop scales at this location, but how does this all fit in regionally? Firstly, we can link the outcrops here to what we see in seismic data. This data covers several tens of kilometers, but obviously this infers geology at a much lower resolution. Secondly, we can use published cross sections from throughout Svalbard from a variety of sources and at different scales. In this case here that we're looking at, we can see regional to semi-regional cross sections that have been published in the Geoscience Atlas of Svalbard. When we zoom in, we can see a cross section of the geology. We can see that the rocks are much more tilted in the west, and this helps us understand why the rocks we saw at Festningen are almost upright. We also know that this was caused by a mountain forming event about 60 million years ago. Let's jump on our snowmobiles and head east to where the geology is a little more horizontal. 
Back at Fessningen, we could see huge amounts of time along a single outcrop, but quite little spatial variety in that geology. In this area, we can see big lateral changes in the geology, but over shorter timescales. To see further back in time here, we would have to go down into the ground. So that's exactly what we're going to do. This is the East Hugda Hydrocarbon Exploration Well. It was drilled in 1966, and it is the deepest wellbore in Svalbard at 3.3 kilometers depth. In addition to showing us the deeper geology, these wellbores also collect a whole suite of physical and chemical data of the rocks they drill through. We'd not normally be able to get such data from the outcrops at the surface due to weathering and chemical alteration. On the right, we can see some of the data from such wells used in a Sanger et al. publication from 2019. So what we can do is link this subsurface well data to the subsurface seismic data. Uh, these 2D seismic lines are situated along the Rhindalen Valley to the north. As we move east along the seismic line, we can see another exploration well. This was probably drilled based on seismic data. We can see a geological structure in the data below the well, and I've interpreted it to look something like this. But what we do know is that this is a rift basin because we can see it in outcrops to the north. Svalbox's map interface allows you to interact with some of the data sets that are directly being streamed to the Svalbox online portal. Different data sets can be accessed through the layers tab and include features, feature layers from the Norwegian Polar Institute, such as the base map and satellite data, geology, as well as different feature layers that are accessible directly from the Svalbox data servers. These include drone footage, exploration well data, sedimentary log data, seismic data, and virtual outcrop models. Just north of Jongebjörn, uh, we find an example of a virtual outcrop model or a digital outcrop model. And by clicking on the polygon, you once again open and access the data in the inset view. And in this case, it actually opens up an interactive 3D model of the outcrop. We can translate and transform the model, and we can even zoom into key details and try to highlight key areas of interest. This works both in the inset as well as in a full screen mode. We normally depart Long Year Bien by sea using ribs uh, called polar circles to access our outcrops. And more recently, we've started using sailboat for more extended field campaigns, whilst larger courses or expeditions can use uh, bigger research vessels. Depending on the stratigraphy that you are working on, uh, accessing an outcrop can be anything from a five meter walk across a beach to a 10 kilometer hike through varied and challenging terrain that sometimes may even require a river crossing. Once at the outcrop, as geologists, we engage in a wide range of activities. For many, it's contemporary geological observations, such as taking structural measurements or recovering sedimentological data, uh, taking samples or just doing basic mapping studies. In addition, many parts of Svalbard's stratigraphy is quite rich with marine and terrestrial fossils, so there are good opportunities to find some really beautiful specimens. More recently, we have focused on outcrop digitalization, where we've been able to collect 3D models uh, from mountain scale right down to cliff sections using drone photogrammetry. In addition, we also conduct more advanced types of field work and have begun integrating geophysical methods such as ground penetrating radar or electrical resistivity tomography to collect data that can be integrated with our drone photogrammetry models and more classic geological observations. As part of an integration study, we collected ground penetrating radar profiles, field data and digital outcrop models. This study was carried out below Fortet in Inner Bill of Jordan. Along the beach, we find paleocarst brackshots as a result of gypsum dissolution. The aim of the study was to map the extent of polyocarst brackshots beyond the outcrop. The GPR profiles we collected are both parallel and perpendicular to the outcrop. Moving one of the GPR profiles across the outcrop model shows that to the east the tilted GPR reflectors correlate very well with the tilted carbonates in outcrop. Displaying the outcrop interpretation on the digital outcrop model, we see that the transition between the paleocarst brackshots and the tilted carbonates is in the same position in outcrop and GPR. With all the information, we were able to trace the paleocarst brackshot through all the GPR profiles of the survey area. And what we try to do is capture the important geological information that allows us to put it all into context. In geology, it is impossible to understand the big things without understanding the small things, and it's impossible to understand the detailed things without understanding the big regional things. Perhaps the biggest scale that we're dealing with is actually the amount of data available to us. 
Svalbox is by no means a complete database, and at present only has a fraction of what we'd like to include. 